This shows 12 hours at the famous Bay of Fundy in Nova Scotia, Canada. It's the biggest tide change in the world. But what force could move such a massive body of water? Gravity. Oh, no. This is a map of tidal amplitude, which is the difference between the low and the high tide in a given place. So what that means is that the low tide might be uh, a meter below sea level, and the high tide might be a meter above sea level, and that would be a tidal amplitude of two meters, which is considered very high. And those high tidal amplitudes are here in red. So this is where the difference between the low tide and the high tide is the greatest. Uh, what you'll notice with this is that there are places where the tidal amplitude is very, very low. It's actually zero. And those are the places here in pink. In these places, there is no tide. Low tide is the same as high tide. What that translates to is zero tidal amplitude. So every place in pink has zero tide. Now, the places where there is no tide, these are called amphidromic points. Um, I will call them tidal nodes because that's the more commoner term for them. And they're here. And these are the places, these points, that there is no tide, literally no tide at all. And there is tons of them all over this map. There's these ones in the center of the oceans, which are quite easy to see. But if you look closely at this map of amphidromic points, tidal nodes, you'll see there's also a number of much smaller ones that operate in smaller regions. I'm going to circle these three. Look, there's three tidal nodes. These are areas, again, with no tide, where the water is still all year long, all day long, all week long, no tide. Here's another one here. Here's another one here. You can see three in here. You start seeing them when you, when you look, you start seeing them all over the place here. See, there's actually three up here in Upper Canada. Now, the greatest density of these that I've seen is in the Polar Sea. Now, this is a polar projection map. This is a favorite by flat earthers. And you can see how many of these nodes are in the Arctic Sea. This is the Arctic Sea up here, the North Polar Sea. You can see all the nodes in here. I'm just circling them all. These are places with no tide. This is just a zoom in on that so you can see. It's almost fractal how this looks because you've got all these little nodes here and then you've also got all big nodes all in the sea. Oh, that's where the purples are, these big tidal nodes. These seem to be the center of what's going on with the tides. This is a better chart of the polar sea. So this is, again, a North Polar projection. I've placed a big X on the North Pole. And you can see even more in here. It seems almost like there's too many to count, like there's areas where they're just extremely dense these tidal nodes. So I think there's even some on these islands. These don't have to be underwater, and I'll talk about that later as well. Look at this. It seems like there's three in a row in here. All these tiny little tidal nodes, it's almost fractal how this seems to work. There's two here. This is Hudson's Bay in Canada, and I'm going to talk about that later. Uh, but first, this is the Mediterranean. There's also tidal nodes in the Mediterranean. It's not as dense maybe as in the Polar Sea. This is another one that's on land, actually. And I think it looks like there's one here. You can see this is Cyprus. So that's sort of how the Mediterranean here is aligned. This is the North Sea near uh, the United Kingdom. And you can see these two tidal nodes here, as well as a tidal node with they've clearly marked on Sweden or Norway. That would be in Norway. I've also got this side by side with an actual animation now, what's nice about this animation, it shows tides. It doesn't just show tidal amplitude. It shows tides in real time. And you can see how high these tides are relatively. These are these, are these huge two or three meter tides 
that are all rushing up through this English channel here. And yet you do have a tidal node very close into here. So you've got these massive tides, but you actually have a tidal node around here. Now this model doesn't show the tidal nodes amazing because you can see some of the tide go in through here. But it's pretty good here where you can see the tides up on this side, then it's up on this side. It's up on this side, and then it's up on this side. And the tidal node itself, the sea level never changes. So this is a better map, a more um, detailed map of the tidal nodes. And it shows another tidal node with this arrow around New Zealand. So New Zealand's another example of a tidal node that's not under the ocean, but still seems to affect the tides. And what I mean by affect the tides, as you can see this arrow, tides revolve around tidal nodes. So a high tide seems to be a bulge of water that will revolve in a certain direction. And it looks like the direction is different in these different nodes. There's clockwise and there's anti-clockwise, but it has nothing to do with the equator because this one you can see here is clockwise. This one you can see is counterclockwise. Uh, this one you can see is also clockwise. And this one here is counterclockwise. And there's really no pattern to whether it's going to be clockwise or counterclockwise. This shows a live animation of the tides. And you can see exactly what I mean when I say that tides revolve around the nodes. So I told you about those two nodes up here in Hudson's Bay. You can see the high tide in red revolving around the coast of Hudson's Bay. You can also see this in uh, New Zealand, which I told you was an onland tidal node. You can see this high tide in red spinning around New Zealand and the low tide in blue, some negative tide, also spinning around New Zealand. And they almost look like magnetic fields in the way that this is uh, pictured here around New Zealand. So this is Hudson's Bay again. This is a different tidal animation. And you can see how these tides seem to revolve around Hudson's Bay. And again, there are tidal nodes, two tidal nodes here in the center of Hudson's Bay that show no tidal movement whatsoever while you have huge tidal movement around these shores. And this again is New Zealand. And this shows those tides revolving around New Zealand. This is a very helpful map. It is a globe model, but it's a helpful map. This shows you the relative you, how, how relatively really very high these tides are in some of these areas. Now, this only shows half the Earth. You can see a little bit over here um, in North America. But if you look at South America, the tides are just enormous at the very, very tip of South America. The same is true up here in uh, Great Britain and in the English Channel. Huge amount of tides. If we go back to this earlier map, you can see that there are all those tidal nodes there at the base of South America, just like you may expect if these tidal nodes were what's creating these tides because you've got a high density of these tides. So you're actually moving a great deal of water against this continent of South America, which is why you've got this black here. This is, I don't know how tall the tidal amplitude is right here, but it's very, very high. I think in some places the amplitude is as much as four meters. So this could be a full four meters here at the in um, Argentina down here. This is the Wiki, from the Wikipedia article on tidal nodes, and it's extremely sparse. There's very, very little information about what these are and what they do. There's a line about how the moon causes them, but it's frankly laughable that people can think after looking at tidal nodes and how tides react around tidal nodes that the moon is doing this. You've got it's this joke of an animation here on the bottom right that that corresponds does not correspond whatsoever with the models I've shown you, as well as this one on the top where you have a bulge both on the moon side and on the non-moon side and nothing on the top or bottom, even though we know that there's a great deal of tide in the southern part and in the northern part of what would be this map here. There's also a list of tidal nodes on Wikipedia. The set of clockwise okay, points include these, but they've only given us um, 16 nodes here, but 
from what I saw from the map, there's all there's a hundred of these things. It could be a hundred. I haven't even counted them. There's so many of these tidal nodes all over the earth, but in some places they are in far greater density than in other places. What got me into looking at this was taking a trip to Hawaii. I'm from Vancouver. This is a picture on the right of a Vancouver tide. And I went to Hawaii expecting tides to behave similarly as they would in Vancouver. I think most people just assume tides are the same everywhere. But the difference between low tide places and high tide places is a matter, it could be a matter of 12 feet, which is, you know, a tall man twice. It's actually an enormous amount of water we're talking about. So it wasn't going on in Hawaii. Hawaii has lots of waves, which I don't think are related to tides. They seem to be wind related in a lot of cases. But the tides, I didn't notice at all. You always notice tides in Vancouver, but I never noticed it once in Hawaii. So I looked into it. I have a few speculations about what tidal notes are. They could be a sea life living deep under the water that's affecting the water, the movement of the water somehow. I've put in the background my favorite sea life, which is the Kraken. It's also, the, it's, it's a fantasy sea life um, because it's so giant, nothing that giant exists that we know of. Uh, or plate boundaries. It could just be where tectonic plates collide and where they're moving against each other. The same thing that causes volcanoes, seems to cause volcanoes and earthquakes, could also be causing the tides. And the third speculation is not my speculation, but it's the speculation that everybody accepts, and that's that the moon is causing the tides. And for everybody, for this to be the consensus, the scientific consensus, is extremely embarrassing. It is extremely embarrassing to me that this is the best that science can give us. And this is a, <laughs> a model of what the tides would look like if it was the moon. And this is being, this is on YouTube as, in fact, what the tides do. But this is nothing like what I've shown you in this presentation. This is pure fantasy. Gravity's punishing. Been floating through space too long?
So welcome back to Flat Water and Flat Earth. What I'm talking about today is the tides. The mainstream definition and explanation for tides are that they're caused by the moon and the moon's passage around the earth. The mainstream model says that the moon is pulling on the water and causing the tides. However, we see that the mainstream model fails miserably in describing and creating the phenomenon of the tides. Their explanation is sorely lacking. What we see is that the time cycle of the moon moving and the tides are absolutely not linked. They are not related whatsoever. And so what we see is that the cycle of the moon moving over the earth has nothing to do with and is not linked whatsoever with the tides. So, it's puzzled men for thousands of years just what is causing the tides. And I think that with the recent discoveries that have been made and some of the pieces that we've put together here that we can now come to the conclusion and find the obvious logic in that the tides are made by the in-sucking seas of the North Pole. This is not necessarily the only place that the Earth would intake water to create the tides. What this is linked to is the cosmic breath streams that were discussed in Heaven and Earth. So I'll read from them now. On the non-revolution of the Earth around the Sun, and on the existence of a summer and of a winter cosmic breath stream. From Heaven and Earth by Gabrielle Henriette. Copernicus put forward the hypothesis of the revolution of the Earth round the Sun in order to explain the cycle of the seasons. His theory is not very satisfactory, seeing that the Earth is supposed to be at its greatest distance from the Sun in the summer during the hot weather, and at its shortest distance in the winter when the temperature is at its lowest. These unusual conditions which clearly contradict the laws of nature, as regards the effect of heat, are, it is said, due to the angle formed by the rays of the Sun as they fall on the Earth's surface. It is also stated that the opposition of the seasons north and south of the equator is due to a tilt of the earth, first on one side and then on the other, which conveniently occurs at the right moment. Nothing is said, however, of the shifting of the waters of the sea and rivers which this change in the center of gravity and in the position of the earth would inevitably bring twice a year. It might also be assumed that under those conditions very high constructions would swerve from the vertical. The American skyscrapers and the Eiffel Tower, for instance, cannot be seen to lean right or left according to the seasons, although this should be a logical and natural consequence of the alternate inclination attributed to the Earth. It must reasonably be said that the circumstances which readily explain in the most extraordinary and unlikely way the cause of the seasons are not credible, especially in view of the fact that Copernicus, when he published his theories on the movement of the Earth in his Treaty on the Revolution of the Celestial Spheres in 1543, insisted on their purely hypothetical nature. He said, The hypothesis of the movement of the Earth is only one which is useful to explain phenomena, but it should not be considered as an absolute truth. It was never his intention, it seems, that his theory should be taken in earnest by his successors. The motion of the Earth in space can be disproved by a comparison between the supposed speed of the Earth and that of the other planets. If we base our considerations on the principle that a body in motion creates an apparent speed equal to its own, in bodies it encounters, which is usually demonstrated by the experiment of a moving vehicle such as a train. It is difficult to judge at first sight whether it's the train, or what can be seen outside it which is moving away. But one fact is certain, that the two speeds, one of which is real and the other is apparent, are equal. For this reason, if the Earth were in motion, it would create in the planets and constellations an initial apparent speed equal to its own. Consequently, there can be no speed in the heavens lower than that of the Earth, since it represents a basic speed from which the apparent motions would be derived. But as it can be seen, the displacement of the constellations and of the planets, with the exception of Mercury and Venus, is slower than the supposed speed of the Earth, which under the circumstances stated above is a material impossibility. It should, moreover, be considered that the real speeds of the planets have to be added to the apparent motions created by the supposed movement of the Earth with the result that the planets ought to pass before us like a flash of lightning. The absence of these mathematical circumstances, which surely have no reason to be invisible, 
ought to be sufficient to prove that the hypothesis of the revolution of the Earth around the Sun, as put forward by Copernicus, has no basis in fact and is not admissible, even if such theory could not be replaced by anything more logical as it is. An entirely different and more rational explanation of the cycle of the seasons, based on a reasoned investigation of existing conditions, can, however, be given, so that it will no longer be necessary to send the Earth traveling into space to this end. The essential feature of the year is its division into two equal periods of six months, based first on the predominating length of the days over that of the nights, and vice versa. Conditions which are governed by the varying hours of sunrise and sunset, and secondly, by the either high or low height reached by the sun in the heavens at midday. The first cycle, during which the days are longer than the nights and the sun reaches its culminating point of the year, extends from the spring equinox to the autumn equinox, i.e. March 21 to September 22 and the second cycle during which, inversely, the duration of the night exceeds that of the days, and the sun descends to its lowest point of the year, extends from the autumn equinox to the spring equinox, i.e. September 23 to March 20. These two six-month periods are also characterized by an opposition of temperature. During the first cycle, which corresponds to spring and summer, the heat gradually rises and falls, while during the second cycle, which comprises autumn and winter, it is the intensity of the cold which progressively increases and decreases. It might be said that it is low. It might be said that it is evident that the heat of the summer and the low temperatures of the winter result from either the high or low heat reached by the sun at midday, and also from the alternate predominating length of the days over the nights. Although it might not be absolutely certain that the variations of temperature are entirely due to these particular circumstances, to what reason must be attributed the variations which exist in regard to the sun's daily height and the hours at which it rises and sets? which seem to determine the various temperatures of the year. These regular fluctuations must necessarily have an origin, and it might be remarked that no scientific research or speculation has ever been attempted in this direction. The sun has been compared by the ancients to a chariot drawn by steeds and to a boat manned by rowers, meaning by this that it is not self-propelled. Its movement, therefore, is derived from some external power, and in that case it would appear that the variations in the height of the sun and its hours of rising and setting are due to the passage and to the impulsion of two regular successive currents, or cosmic breath streams of six months each, i.e. a warm increasing and decreasing breath stream prevailing from the spring equinox to the autumn equinox, followed by a cold increasing and decreasing breath stream from autumn to spring. And the conclusion is that the impulse of these two summer and winter cosmic breaths govern the height of the sun and that they also have the effect of either advancing or retarding the hours of sunrise and sunset, on which the, depend the respective lengths of days and nights. So it's interesting to note here that it may not be, the, it may not be that the cosmic breath streams are governing the height of the sun, but they may be a function of the height of the sun. It is, therefore, the arrival and growing intensity of the warm summer breath stream which from March 21 causes the sun to gradually ascend to its culminating point of the year at the June solstice, and the decreasing intensity of the same warm stream which, after the solstice, causes the height of the sun to decline steadily until 22 September, the moment of the equinox, when the cold current sets in. At the same time, the impulse of this warm cosmic stream has the effect of advancing the hour of sunrise and retarding that of sunset, so that the days become longer than the nights. On the other hand, it is the arrival and growing intensity of the cold winter breath stream about the 23rd September, which causes the sun to further descend to its lowest point of the year at December solstice, and the decreasing intensity of this cold breath which, after the winter solstice, causes the sun to rise again until 21 March, when the warm breath takes over. At the same time, the cold current has the effect of retarding the hour of sunrise and of advancing the sunset, whereby nights become longer than the days. As it can be seen, these two semi-annual cosmic streams, or currents, warm and cold, each represent a complete breath comprising a rising phase of inspiration from the equinox to the solstice, and a following phase of expiration from the solstice to the following equinox. And it's these two double phases of a duration of three months each, controlling the daily height of the sun and the hours of its rising and setting, which causes the four seasons. It may be explained that the principle of the existence of cosmic breaths is not new, and that it is to be found in the cosmogonies of the Orient. It has, here in particular, been borrowed from a French translation of Hindu texts in which the movement of the sun, 
was said to respond to the influence of universal streams of breath. The author has adapted this theory to existing circumstances, thus permitting the specific respiratory nature of these cosmic breaths to be discovered. This fact is completely demonstrated apart from the obvious parallel of the phases of inspiration and expiration rhythmically governing the lengths of days and nights and the height of the sun, by a comparison with another factor which is the pause existing between inspiration and expiration. This pause is precisely reproduced by the solstice, which corresponds to the stoppage of the cosmic breath between the two phases. The existence of a breath governing the movement of the sun becomes here manifest, since the height of the latter at midday does not vary during the solstice interval, nor do the hours of its rising and setting. The respective lengths of the day and of the night remain unchanged, the sun rising and setting at the same hours for no less than five days. It could be added, as further proof of the existence of a cosmic breath, that the high temperatures of July and August, which are really abnormal, since it should be cooler as they occur, when the days become shorter and the height of the sun decreases, that they are due, in fact, as in the function of respiration, the pressure of the breathing out is greater towards the middle of the expiration phase, and consequently, the temperature rises. On the other hand, it is observed that the cold becomes more intense in January and February. Although the days are growing longer and the decrease in the intensity of the cold breath is causing the sun to rise. This recrudescence of the cold is due to the same reason of pressure increase in the middle of the phase of expiration. And the cosmic breath being cold, it follows that there is a further drop of temperature during this period, from which it can be seen that the pressure of the respective cosmic breath streams is susceptible of warming or cooling in the atmosphere, as the case may be, regardless of the height of the sun. It may be remarked that during the time of the solstices, when the height of the sun at midday is stabilized for a few days, either at its highest or lowest point in the heavens, man, by reflex, follows the cosmic conditions by stopping his working activities and taking a rest in fall. These particular moments are also the occasion of great religious Christic festivals, Christmas at the winter solstice and Corpus Christi at the time of the summer solstice which points undoubtedly to the existence of an association between the Sun and Christ. This association exists also in the case of the Easter festival of the resurrection of Christ, which in reality celebrates the solar new year. Easter takes place on the Sunday following the new moon, after the spring equinox on March 21, which date marks the beginning of the spring and summer cycle of the Sun. When the height of the latter at noon begins to rise over the equator according to the actual astronomical way of reckoning the solar declination. It is also obvious that the opposition of the seasons north and south of the equator result from a corresponding opposition in the circulation of the two breaths around the Earth, i.e. when the warm breath is in the northern hemisphere, the cold one is in the other, and vice versa, so that it is simultaneously summer in one part of the world and winter in the other. Thus, the warm six-month breath which commenced in the northern hemisphere at the spring equinox comes to an end at the autumn equinox, about the 22nd of September when the transposition of the warm and cold breath takes place. The warm breath passes in the southern hemisphere for the spring-summer cycle, and at the same time the cold breath leaving said hemisphere enters ours for the autumn-winter cycle. The respective intensities of the two breaths, both at the end of their expiration phase at the moment are, thus, equalized, so as to permit their transposition. And at the same time, the lengths of the day and night find themselves also equalized to 12 hours each in both hemispheres. It is also most probable that the atmospheric disturbances which prevail at the time of the equinoxes are due to the mutual replacement of the breaths, and to their passage in a different part of the world. It should be added, however, that in the above theory concerning the cycle of the seasons, the cosmic breaths do not act directly on the sun, but that there are intermediate circumstances which will be dealt with later on with regard to the origin itself of the sun. Okay, so coming back from that from the cosmic breath streams, we can see how it's a great description and we can see how it works very easily and makes sense to some extent. Obviously some of the working factors of it would still be need, need to be worked out. So what I think is happening or a possible part of this is, let, as you see here, I'm showing you this this is the weather patterns over the Earth. 
see how on the outside here, which would be the southern latitudes, it's moving in this direction, but in what we call the northern latitudes, really the central latitude, the center, central ring of the Earth, we see that the weather is moving in this direction. It's moving the opposite way. So this again ties in with those breath streams that she's talking about. And it's interesting, if you look at the four corners of the Earth like this, and we think of the four cosmic breath streams, you could see how if they were blowing from this way, from these two directions, east and, well, okay, let's just call it left and right. And if it was blowing in those directions at different altitudes, and then it was blowing in these directions from north and south here, or top up and down, top and bottom of the picture, that if the breath was being pushed from there, from also from different altitudes, what you would create is sort of this, this toroidal vortex of air in the center. And you see how that, that would create the four winds. But also, see how they're moving in opposite directions in the north and the south here. It's very hard to explain how that would work, unless if you look at and consider that the dome itself would possibly be separated here and that one part of the dome or one portion is moving in this direction and one is moving in the other. And it would also, if you think about pumps and you think about pneumatics and how to move air, if you have two pieces of glass like that with some sort of a, a buffer in between them or a, a, an airtight seal in between them, and as you turn it, you would create suction and pressure which would create, could create the forces of the wind that we're looking at and talking about. So, just lots more interesting stuff to look at that makes more sense to me for our flat earth model and makes much more sense to me than, than obviously the globe model, which is ludicrous, ridiculous. So, I hope you guys can see how that ties in there with the glass or the that that would, that would make the pump action to create these cosmic breath streams. So after that is created, after it creates the breath streams, that the water cycles on Earth will be a similar, not similar, but, but that it would run on the same principles and at the same timings, that it would be interlinked and correlated as far as timing. So the water will be part of this action of suction and the, the action of moving the air. So as the water is drawn into the the whirly pool at the North Pole here, this gigantic whirly pool, and as it circles around Mount Meru and plunges down into the depths of the earth, that would create that suction and pull the air towards that area. And then other air would have to come in from the outside or from the other parts of of the planisphere to fill in and make up for the diffusion and make up for the loss of those that sucked air that's going in at the north here. So what we see on flat earth and in reality is that diffusion and particle physics are really the the theories and the the physics that work on our physical plane. Particle theory and particle physics over many years has been shown to be the true functioning of atomic theory. When you take a candle and light it, what you see is that the hot air rises and that cool air is sucked in at the base of the candle to fill in for where that hot air is being ejected or being raised. And that creates a quick, simple convection current. And we see this every day in all of our lives, in everything that we do. Particle diffusion, moving from high to low density, is how the world works. This is how the atmosphere works. This is how things actually work. And this is why, and explains how, rocketry and the true physics that 
are involved in spaceflight come into play. Because diffusion rules on flat Earth. When you get up to that altitude and there are no more particles to suck in or blow through a jet or to propel yourself off of from a rocket because there are no particles there you therefore have no push from the rocket you have no propulsion because there is nothing to propulse yourself or propel yourself off of so to summarize and in conclusion this is how the tides actually work they're not pulled by the moon they're not pulled by magnetism it's the cosmic cycles that the earth does with itself with the dome air particle diffusion the water movement and suction and pneumatics and this is how the tides actually function thanks for watching guys all done all right bubble buddy you dig them out while i get some cotton candy don't just stand there dude the tide's coming in oh!